Thank you, Dan. Now, Linda, let's get stuck right into it. Okay. Um, it's a it's a wonderful book. Thank the you. reason we need to get stuck into it is because you, ladies and gentlemen, need time to ask questions, and because even though it is, I think she's actually probably claiming correctly, it is the shortest history of China. It's a bloody long history. So, <laughs> got to get moving. Um, but let's start with you. The, uh, I was really taken by, in fact, the dedication in this, which you've written in memory of my parents, Lewis and Naomi Javen, who encouraged me to study whatever interested me. Full stop. What interested me? was China. <laughs> so why? Where did it come from? Uh, it was completely random. I entered university thinking that I was going to do political science and then work for citizens' rights and environmental organizations and change the world, save the world, whatever. Um, and in my first year at university, I was at Brown University in the States, and they encourage you to explore and take different courses. And um, so I was asking people, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to take physics, <laughs> physics for non-physics majors. I'm, I, add. Um, I didn't take any further physics. Um, <laughs> I took a bunch of courses. And I asked somebody, can you, can you tell me about a course that I just wanted something that I wouldn't think of myself that was taught well? And somebody said, oh, East Asian history is fantastic, taught by Professor Lee Williams. And uh, it's a great course. So I said, hmm, I've never, <laughs> I don't think I'd had a single thought about China or Japan um, really in my head before then. I mean, I just can't remember any thinking anything at all. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. And it was so interesting that I then took more and more courses and then Lee Williams said to me, you have to learn Chinese. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I did really badly. Why? Well, <laughs> I was like, I, I, you know, I, I took French in high school and it was a, you know, <laughs> It was not pretty. Um, and he said, no, 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 you have to take Chinese because you will never understand Chinese history if you don't learn the language. You will never understand anything if you don't about this country if you don't learn the language. And so I was like, oh, OK. And then I loved it. I mean, I loved it as much as I loved the history, and it each deepened the other. So I was off and running. And I never saved the world. <laughs> Are there, are there elements of it, 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 as you learned more about China, that it came together? I mean, was there a, was there a Rosetta Stone moment? Was there, was there a moment when you thought, I've got this, I've got this? There were many moments like that, and each one was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I still have it, you know, that I've, that I've got it now. I mean, because China is so complicated. The history is so complex. And I'm trying to remember what it was in here. I was, I then began reading something else um, just the other day. And I was like, oh my God, I just hadn't realized the full historical background of the emergence of the philosophy of legalism, which you don't have to worry about. But I do introduce you to the main legalist philosopher who's had a huge influence on China. Um, and then I was reading this stuff about the emergence and how he kind of consolidated everything. Else. I, like, oh, I didn't actually realize that. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's important for the shortest history of China. <laughs> that, <laughs> but um, you know, and the thing about this is the thing about Chinese history. So you learn, uh, you start out, you learn the dynasties, and you're going. Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. You know, you're going, Opium Wars, what was that about? You know, and you're kind of trying to get the basic line of it or, uh, you know, the, the through story. And then um, you realize that you never understood anything because you didn't really understand how every dynasty wrapped itself, as, as my friend Jia Jian Ying, a writer in, in New York, says, it, basically, every dynasty has wrapped itself in the cloak of Confucianism, short short explanation of that, Confucius said that rulers should rule by example. So a ruler being good and moral and making the right decisions, would it would flow down into society. And so that's, that's, that's a really, really short version of Confucius. There's a slightly longer version here. Um, but Han Feidze, who is the philosopher of legalism, who lived slightly after that, was like, there's no right and wrong. Right and wrong is whatever a ruler says it is. And the way you rule is not by moral example. That's ridiculous. The way you rule is you create laws that punish and reward. 
and therefore you shape people's behavior. So Jia Jianying has said that Confucianism is like the cloak of every, every dynasty, every emperor has put that cloak on, but inside there's always the heart of darkness. Han Feizi and legalism. I wasn't going to go straight into the motive. Sorry, that was no, no. But no, but since we're here, um, just let's look. You've mentioned legalism. You've mentioned Confucianism. It's extraordinarily powerful influence. There's the third path um, is Taoism, <laughs> and so which is that? Uh, define that briefly and say, do they fight or are they friends? Okay, so Taoism. Um, all of this originated around the same time. Confucius was born in 551 BCE. Uh, Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, is a completely mysterious figure. Uh, we don't actually know when he was born, but the, the philosophy kind of came up around the same time. And then, um, and then there's uh, Han Feizi was a little bit after that. Now, Taoism talks about, and that's really hard to um, explain very, very briefly, but it talks about the power of non-action. You know Bruce, Bruce Lee and be water? That comes from Taoism because Lao Tzu was talking about how water, be like water as it flows downhill, it flows into vessels and so on. There's the, the quote, the full quote is in there. But um, what the Taoists were very uninterested in government because they believed that the best ruler basically sat there, appeared to do nothing and everything kind of worked. Flowed through. So the Confucians were fascinated by the Taoists because the Taoists were really smart. <laughs> and the Confucians believed that every educated person had a duty to advise their ruler, um, to help with good government. And the Taoists were like, nah, I'd rather sit here and fish, you know. <laughs> and so there's so many stories about the Confucians trying to get the Taoists to come on board, and the Taoists are always making fun of the Confucians. The Confucians are like the straight men in every Taoist comedy routine. Um, and so Taoism as a, as a stream of thought um, connects to a lot of the really interesting people, the nonconformists, the eccentrics, the hermits, the, um, there's a group called the, the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove. They're like my favorites, <laughs> I love them. And they were these totally eccentric characters who were complete Taoists, and it was a period of great disorder in China. Um, I think there were third, oh my god, I should know this, third century, There's I think. a very, very good little two pages in the front which have it all broken down. Time. Oh, yes. Dynasty. I should report. consult my own timeline, <laughs> That's right? That's right. <laughs> but the, 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 um, the seven sages of the bamboo grove, who were, this is kind of the essence of Taoism versus Confucianism in one anecdote, which is in here. And that is, you've got this guy called Liu Ling, and he was a famous poet and a great drunk. He, used to, he had a servant who he always had carrying, a, they, he had a servant who would carry a jar of wine in the one hand and a shovel in the other, so that he could always get a drink. But if his lifestyle caught up with him, he could get a quick burial. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Liu Ling, um, Liu Ling was this famous drunk, right? And, and he used to make fun of the Confucians who would come and visit him and try to get him to be serious and talk about things and talk about you know, affairs of state. And he would compare himself lying on his mat, getting pissed, while the Confucians were, their words were, were like little buzzings of flies and all this. Anyway, one day, these uh, Confucians came to visit Liu Ling and they knocked on his door and he opened it up and he was getting completely drunk and he was naked. And they were so shocked, you know, being Confucians are very proper. I mean, the Confu Confucius actually talked about the color of the proper car color for a man's lapels, you know, they were very like that. And so they were like, oh, and there's Liu Ling, um, completely stark naked. And, uh, and so Liu Ling looked at them and he said, I take heaven and earth as my pillars and my roof. I take my house as my robe and my pants, what, gentlemen, are you doing in my pants? <laughs> <laughs> and that, pissed as a parrot. <laughs> and that's kind of, that's a beautiful anecdote that sort of just shows you that the Taoists and the Confucians were never going to get along. But I can see, I mean, I'm beginning to see that the magic of it, because you look at our political system, liberal, labor, Democrats, right? 
And they do nothing. That's right. <laughs> and drink. Um, and, but any country which has actually these great sage, these rivers of sagedom feeding into their system is intrinsically a very interesting one and impressive. Mm. Let me ask you, uh, let, let, let's talk a little bit about the about the beginning of things in China because um, we're not going to go through all the dynasties. It, it, the book <laughs> is for that and they are fascinating. It's a really engaging book. But um, I like, I like, let's start with the story which is where it, where it does begin, when, when, when the unification of, of China happens in 221 BC. You think what the Western world was doing then. 221 BC, a guy called Qin Zhuang, he was the founder. He's the guy, he's a complete um, uh, egocentric. He, built, he was the one who built himself the terracotta warriors. Yes. That they were going to protect him. Um, is that the foundation story of China because it was the first unification? Uh, there's so many foundation stories. It's like learning about Chinese history. It's like, oh, that, oh, yes, got it. Um, and so in some ways, a foundation story is the dynasty before the Zhou dynasty that broke up. Confucius and the others uh, arose in this crazy divided time. Now, there was a time of great warfare of, of, of all these states fighting each other. And Qin, Qin Shi Huang, um, was he, he became king of the state of Qin when he was 13. And he set out to conquer all the other states, and he did. This is a really important moment in Chinese history. In China, they say that he unified China. I have a map here of the Qin. Yes, he unified a whole bunch of states in China, but it didn't include Xinjiang, Tibet, the Northeast, the Southwest, or much of even the um, Southeast. So it was, it was the states at the time that he unified, but it wasn't what we think of as all China. And yet, this is such an important story because it's about ending chaos, division, and violence, and bringing everything together. And he didn't just bring the states together. He thought, how do I create a unified state? So among the things he did, was um, he abolished uh, the system where uh, in the past kings would say, um, ah, yes, my child, you can have this part of the fiefdom to run and you may have that part, you know, and, and so on. He said, no, that's actually a, a, a recipe for disaster and division and, 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 and all that. So he assigned administrators, neutral administrators. He, he looked at the language. There was written, there's been written Chinese since 3,500 years ago in the shape of um, characters inscribed on shell and bone. Um, but there was a lot of differences in the way they were written from place to place. So he put all of them together, unified the writing. He unified weights and measures. He even unified the cart axles um, because, can anybody, does anybody, it, it was really funny because I thought, I, my, my editor said to me, why did he do that? And I thought, I've just written that line and I have no idea. <laughs> so I went back and I looked it up. And the reason he unified the cart axles was because with, with dirt roads, you get ruts, right? And if you don't have unified uh, distances between your wheels, everybody's going to keep falling into the wrong ruts. And this meant better transportation. I have to say, I so took against him because he was a book burner. Oh, yeah, he? now, he did this is the thing. books. He was a terrible person um, in, in many ways. I'm, I'm not a great Xin Shi Huang fan because no, he understand. burned the books and he buried the scholars, according to, you know, what everybody says. And I actually point out that he might not have actually buried the scholars because it wasn't in the legal code at the time, but we'll go with it. Um, so supposedly buried the scholars. Later, Mao would say, ah, Qin Shi Huang, that was nothing. He says he buried 460 scholars. Well, I've done 46,000 or 460,000 or something. I can't remember what Mao said. But yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a tyrant. And so this has left China with a number of really complicated legacies. One is this feeling of unification as being really good because it ends division and violence and chaos. But does it have to come at the price of tyranny? Yeah. And that's what I think is so, which I think you draw up um, and leave, leave also for us to deduce something, mm. which, is, which is that, in fact, 
it's not just a history book. It's sort of a primer for understanding China now because just as we wear our short history, imagine how much longer their long history is. And, that, and it's like the story, we have a linear past, you know, the, the UK, US, we tend to, you know, we start here, they freed the slaves or, you know, they, they burned the missions or whatever terrible things. It does tend to be terrible. They did. But it's linear. Whereas this history, Utah, is, it's, um, it revolves, it's circular. It's, there's so many theories on how Chinese history works and Chinese traditional historiography has been about circularity, has been about dynastic cycles and it's been about how um, a, a dynasty starts out fresh. It starts out with somebody who has vigor and the mandate of heaven um, and they found their dynasty and the dynasty starts off fine but it gets overtaken by corruption and heaven shows its displeasure through things like earthquakes and comets and things like that, like earthquakes like the one in 1976 that took down the city of Tangshan, caused I think a quarter of a million people to lose their lives. And that was interpreted or whispered at the time that that was Mao losing the mandate of heaven. So that idea persists. People actually still have that notion. So when you lose the mandate of heaven, then rebellions arise and people start um, uh, trying to overthrow you and then they form a new vigorous dynasty with the mandate of heaven and so on. But not before the custodians of the old dynasty have become repressive and corrupt. Yes, when they become repressive and corrupt, they lose the mandate. That's the theory. That's the theory, yes. <laughs> um, as I said, we're not going to go through all the dynasty, but I, I just think we should come to some of the characters. We've been talking about the thought and the phenomenon. Um, and I think the Han Dynasty, there was a, two of them, the, the, they came along um, after this first founding dynasty. And I'm just not going to beat around the bush. The, the two features of this, there seem to be a lot of very tough-minded concubines. <laughs> and <laughs> heck, those eunuchs. What, so let's start with the concubines. Why are there such powerful huge figures in Chinese history. So con most concubines, like most eunuchs, were not powerful. Most concubines were sort of confined to the women's quarters in the palaces and summoned when the emperor wanted to sleep with them and then sent back. Most eunuchs were actually people who did menial tasks in the palace. People, eunuchs are castrates. And um, we'll go to the origin of them mm. in a second. but. What would happen is if a woman became an empress or a favored concubine, um, there was an opportunity, which, I mean, who wouldn't take it, to then advance her family's fortunes. Um, and in some cases, some really famous cases, to take that power for herself when the opportunity came. And some of them were, some of these, these women were really ruthless, like incredibly ruthless. It was amazing. But they were also brilliant. There were a number of very, very brilliant women who um, who took power. But there one seemed way to be the an inordinate number of them over the years, <laughs> over the centuries. Probably enormous numbers of not these. Not quite enough for my thing, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, some people they had them under control. I, li I like the um, the empress who who saw her husband's concubine as a rival oh and decided God. this is cheap. Shichi, the Empress Shichi. Um, and she decided not only did this um, concubine need to be got rid of, she actually went in, she, she um, chopped up her, her legs and her feet. She gouged um, out her eyes. Gouged out her eyes, and then she threw her in a fecal pit. Now, this With is pigs. not the normal way. That's not so she, That was an earlier was one. An earlier but one. Yeah. but yeah. It, was, it was a very unpleasant <laughs> consequence of being a concubine in this case. Yeah, extremely unpleasant. Um, there was, what, what, what had happened was, um, there was there were two sons. Um, and the son of the empress, who had been with her husband when he founded the dynasty and when he was just a peasant and a rebel. So she, she was like the old wife, you know. And they had a son called Ying, who was not very vigorous. He was not very warrior-like. And so a bit of a disappointment to dad. Um, and <laughs> she was very protective of him. So when there was a battle, and, he, and, and I think 
I think dad had been wounded and he was like, son, you go out and lead those troops. Um, his mother said, no, no, he'll stay at home. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so she went to war. Um, he then falls in love with a younger concubine, right? And he has a son with that concubine. And so the thing is, is that it was really clear that he wanted to choose the other son, who was more of a kind of a boy, I suppose, um, to be his successor. So his empress was like, well, I'm not going to let that happen, am I? And the, the Ying, her son, everybody sensed she was going to be up to something. So Ying kept his half-brother by his side to keep him protected from his mother because he just didn't trust what was going to happen. And um, the one day, and he even had him sleep in his, in his room, the one day Ying gets up early to go hunting, the mother gets straight in there and poisons him to death. <laughs> and then she does all this stuff to the mother. And she's really admired, isn't she, in China? Well, she, <laughs> the strange thing is she was really cruel, but she, she's, she's, there's a lot of misogynistic stuff about these women as well. So I wouldn't say like widely admired, but certainly one of the things about her was that when she was in charge of stuff, she actually ran things pretty well. Mm. And that's true of a lot of the different um, women. Tsi Xi, who is the one you mentioned, is from a later dynasty. And she was the Empress Dowager who... For 57 years. <laughs> it's an extraordinary. Period. And that wasn't, she wasn't officially the, the Emperor. So she always had to have like a, a puppet. Um, when her son died, she made sure her, th I think, three-year-old nephew got on the throne. And then she was still his regent. I mean, you, you do, do give us a lot of female characters in yeah. this book. Was that deliberate? I mean, totally deliberate, yeah. Has it been not credited in it, the past? Yeah. In the past, if you read other short general histories, you will not get all these. But none as short as this, because this is the no, shortest. This is the shortest, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you'll get, you don't get quite as many. So, for example, I very consciously, I thought, if I'm going to feature a couple of inventors, right? Because China invented everything. That's all you have to know. They invented everything. <laughs> everything. Um, and so there's so many amazing inventions and technological advances until it all kind of stopped, which is another story. But um, so who do you talk about? You know, uh, I thought, OK, there's one. The guy who invented paper was a eunuch. We'll get back to eunuchs. Um, and he was quite interesting. So I talk about him. There's a woman who, I love her story. She was a, um, she was just a, a village woman, a peasant, and she had a really abusive marriage and her in-laws were particularly cruel to her. So uh, she escaped, she just ran away. And she got on a boat and went to Hainan Island. And at that time that was pretty wild and there were tribes people and stuff. And she fell in with the Lee tribe. And at, with the Lee tribes people, they were very good at cotton weaving and dyeing and stuff. So she spent 23 years there. She obviously didn't miss her husband. Um, and she was 23 years there. She learned all this stuff from them, went back to her village, and she was the inventor of a whole bunch of things like a better cotton gin and a three treadle loom, I think, and all these machines helped t t teach other women from her area, and that's the foundation of China's textile industry in the area kind of close to Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So what an interesting story. And I had never read it in uh, the regular history books, but what I have is I have a bunch of, because <laughs> I just buy these sort of things, I have a bunch of books that are in Chinese that are like great women from throughout Chinese history, you know, and she was in it. And I was like, wow, is she for real? So I began pursuing it and then I found more about her and verified that um, because it was it was kind of a I mean it's not the sort of book you're going to go oh everything oh sorry everything in here is definitely true but it actually was <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was always attentive to the idea of where the women were and my favorite woman can I just tell yes you, you can tell my it. favorite woman <laughs> is Tang Chun Ying she was a feminist a fiery feminist at the end of the Qing dynasty so we're talking about early 20th century and she, she, was, she was really something. Her dad was a Qing dynasty general and he taught her martial arts and he gave her a boy's education. She then went and learned bomb making from Russian anarchists. 
when Sun Yat-sen was talking about leading a revolution against the, uh, he formed this revolutionary alliance against the Qing to set up a republic, she was the first female member. She raised an all-female army to fight in the revolution and led them. And then her whole thing was like, yeah, Sun Yat-sen, I've told you I want gender equality, <laughs> right? Female suffrage. When the Republic comes, he's like, uh, maybe it's not the time. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? <laughs> um, <laughs> never the time. It's not really the right time. So she was. So what did she do? She got her girls together, and they raided the National Assembly, smashed windows, kicked guards to the ground, and boxed the ears of the legislators and twisted their beards with, as one newspaper report had it, their delicate hands. <laughs> and what happened to him? What happened? Sun Yat-sen still was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it, but not quite the time. She just ended up going back to her village. Yeah. Is she a hero or heroine in China? Only among people who follow feminist history. Yeah. So it, it really is worse than here. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> I mean in, in feminism is a banned word on the Chinese internet. Is that right? It's a sensitive word. Yeah. It alerts the little sensor bots. And is that because it's women or just because it's anything which is contrary to the central tenets of belief? It's because it's contrary, um, but it's crazy. This is actually the first time in communist Chinese history that women, uh, that feminists have actually been suppressed. And it began in 2000 and I think 15 with the Feminist Five all they wanted to do was hold up signs against uh, sexual harassment in the subways. Mm. And they were arrested and Xi Jinping just was like, nah, not having that. Yeah. Before we go, we go on to Xi Jinping and where, where things are today, um, I'm, because by definition if we're telling a history of any country, uh, one does tend to focus on the, the leading figures. How did you access a sense, which you do convey, but, but how, can you explain how you access um, a sense of what common people, what the ordinary people, so they're not just the big Chinese mass of the, the, the millions over there. One, one of the life. really, really important ways of doing that is through art, poetry and literature. So to give you a couple of examples, I'll give you two examples. Cao Cao was a famous general and a famous politician in general, and he's, he plays a fairly big part in the story. But I thought, okay, he's a famous poet. He, there was this devastating series of wars, and he wrote a poem about bones of the people bleaching on the landscape. And it's a beautiful poem, so I quote a little bit of it that gives you a sense of the common people. Um, another poet, Du Fu, um, was forced to flee when um, there was a coup in the Tang Dynasty um, or an attack. There was something that happened and he and his family had to flee and he talked about his, his little son bravely sort of forging on, I think his little daughter biting him in her hunger and, and you know, you get this sense of the people fleeing. He was one of them. Um, but also there's a Song Dynasty painting, a very, very famous painting, and it's a really, really long scroll. And it's about a city, but the city has never been, it's kind of an abstract city. It actually doesn't correspond to any of the great cities of the Song Dynasty. We're talking about, I don't know, 11th century or so. Anyway, this um, scroll has fantastic detail. It's really detailed. So you've got people snacking on a bridge. You've got people selling things by the side of the road. You've got camel trains in the countryside. You've got donkeys. You've got farmers in their fields outside the city. You have um, restaurants. You have all this stuff, like all the life in the street. People washing their clothes in the river. And so you get a, this is, you have to look at this stuff, you mm. know, and the folk songs that are in the, one of China's oldest books, the Book of Odes, in which they, there's love stories, there's stories about farming, domestic life. There's also stories that take the piss out of, um, out of, rich people and nobles mm. for having, oh, how did you get all that grain in your yard when you don't actually plant anything? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of which, one of the things we've, we've chatted about actually before is that 
is that um, that the the legacy when you have a a story a legacy so long and it turns it doesn't just go into the past it turns because because it is carried in the memory of the people in a way I think I've not yeah. gathered in any other country except maybe the French but that's all one way yeah <laughs> us um, <laughs> one of the things you said is that, is that therefore the things that go wrong as well as go right become more than an event that happened then that it's dead and gone um, and corruption which in fact brought down the very first the Qin dynasty mm -hmm. has been the, the thing that keeps being the it's like the spectre at every feast can you talk a bit about how that story became so deep for the Chinese and how they are still reacting to it now um, corruption really from all the different historians of China it, the Chinese historians of the various dynasties would really note how a, a, a regime a, a dynasty would end up being corrupt, would end up with its, um, with various eunuchs or officials accumulating unbelievable amounts of loot while the people went hungry. Um, people, who, tax collectors who were incredibly cruel and exploited the people but were never called to account um, because the regime at this point didn't care. These things become embedded in the notion of when a government has to go. And so when um, Xi Jinping came into power in 2012, one of the first things he did was launch a major anti-corruption campaign. But isn't one of the first things pretty much every ruler does when they come in? Pretty is much. Launch an anti-corruption yeah. campaign? Yeah. I mean, some in particular, like the Ming Dynasty uh, founder, Hong Wu, is one of the first things he did. And also, like Xi Jinping, one of the other first things he did was create do a, a giant purge and get rid of all of his enemies in the court mm. and like Xi Jinping he also uh, didn't trust scholars intellectuals ministers who knew too much mm. you know who had independent thought and might actually advise him differently from the way he wanted to be advised so in what way does that horror fear inevitability of corruption play out in contemporary politics do you think well, I think we've seen with um, she, she's major um, purge uh, that that's ongoing. And the interesting thing is the people who get purged are never people in his exact clique, you know, in his little on his side. It's always other people. I'm not saying they weren't corrupt, but there's a way of going after corruption that favors that 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 well, I wouldn't say favors, but that goes after your enemies you know, and clears them out of the way. And there was a really interesting story, which I think probably people might have remembered from a couple of years ago, or from, well, not that many, like from 2011 or so. Bo Xilai was seen as a rival to Xi. Like, nobody knew who was going to exactly get to be the supreme leader. And Bo Xilai himself, he was the mayor party secretary of Chongqing um, in the southwest. Big, big city that actually is is provincial level in terms of being an administrative unit. And and he uh, ran his own anti-corruption campaign and was very famous for it. But turns out he was as corrupt as the rest. Mm -hmm. And he got caught because his wife happened to murder an Englishman. <laughs> Bad move. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, Corruption is just this constant thing that just keeps bubbling. I think you were saying it's, it's a wound. It's a wound they have. Which, which, why is it more extreme than in other countries where corruption occurs, of course, as well? Um, or why is it more abhor uh, abhorrent? Um, it, it, well, I think I don't know if it's more abhorrent, but it does cause. There's such a link to suffering of people, you know, because of corruption. Um, but it's. It's certainly when you don't have a system that is built for transparency or accountability. And where where the emperors traditionally went wrong was when they refused to listen to advice. So you would have somebody like Hai Rei, the, minister, the, the upright minister of the Ming dynasty, um, who would try to advise these emperors. And the emperors, would, one of them wanted him killed, but he died first, so he, Hai Rei survived. Um, people don't want to listen to the advice that means they have to lose a little bit of something. Mm. And so that's been a problem. But I mean, one of the things about this through story, this constant awareness of the past, that's also carried through literature. 
these stories that keep coming around and people still, people in China, Chinese students un, from 1961, I think, studied um, examples from Sima Qian, who was a historian who lived in the Han Dynasty. So in other words, a historian who lived 2,000 years ago. Um, students today, or from 1961, were studying examples of good people and bad people from Sima Qian. And one of them was a great rebel who, as the story goes, he only everything had gotten so shit in that dynasty um, that he only, the Qin Shi Huang dynasty, the Terracotta Warriors guy, um, that he only had to wave his hands and, and, and everybody responded and the rebellion rose up. So he was somebody who Mao wanted everybody to study. Xi Jinping, a couple of years ago, thought, hmm, maybe that's not what I want young people to be thinking about. So he replaced in all the textbooks that with another story from Sima Qian's history of 2,000 years ago of a Han Dynasty general who was famous for obeying the rules. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned Mao, which was probably in our lifetime has been the greatest, biggest event in China. In fact, you know, this is enormously powerful. It feels like, unlike these kind of continuing cycles, um, it seems like a radical break, that that was in fact something entirely different. Did it, and, and it, was it, and, and if so, did it shock China, did it thrill China? What, what was it that grabbed them? So the background to Mao's rise is a couple of things. One is the May 4th movement. So after the Republic was founded, um, and it was kind of like, wow, same, same. This isn't really going very well. And a bunch of other things. Um, it, it, I won't go into all of it. But basically a, a, a sense that we need to renew China. The youth rose up. And it was like we need new thinking. Uh, we need self-reflection. We need a new way of being, a new way of government, and so on. The Communist Party arose out of that movement. They were founded in 1921. At that time, the, the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, was in control. And the Nationalists were unbelievably mm. corrupt. Mm. They were like spectacularly corrupt. They could, mm. The Nationalists could compete with any Ming eunuch with his 24 solid gold beds or whatever, you know. Um, it, it was incredible. And the people were really suffering. Japan had invaded um, the, the, the imperialist incursions of the 19th century. <laughs> meant that foreigners still ran Shanghai and Yangtze shipping and a whole bunch of other ports. China was really hurting. It had many terrible, um, unfair fines imposed upon it by these different powers. Every time they, they did something terrible to China, they said, OK, now you pay for it. So China was in really bad shape. The government was really corrupt. So Mao and the communists they arose as this sort of pure, uncorruptible, uncorrupted force that was purely for the people and not for these rich people, you know, these rich people who everybody felt exploited by. Problem is, even by the time they got to Yan'an, which was after the Long March, and they were in the caves of Yan'an, um, already several people were saying, one lost, literally lost his head as a result, you know what, there's a lot of privilege going on here. He said, you know, there's not a single driver who can aspire to the same level of food as, as you know, an, as one of the leaders. Um, and that was Wang Shiwei, and he lost his head. Ding Ling, a famous feminist writer, communist, you know, these people were all totally with the revolution. And she was like, you know what, I see a lot of patriarchal, you know, old-fashioned mm. attitudes going on towards women. She didn't lose her head, but she was purged. Um, and so even before the communists took power, there were these little signs that the old problems were still there, that they were still bubbling along under the surface. So the communists did do a lot better than the nationalists. Um, there was this thing about we will not take a single you know, um, piece of fruit from the orchards of the peasants that we pass. You know, we will not take a single needle or thread without paying for it. So they did have a good start, but corruption caught up with them. And even Mao's day, it wasn't as extreme as post-Mao, 
but there was privilege and privilege is a kind of a kind of a, a kind of corruption so there was a very strong hierarchy throughout the Maoist era of, of uh, Maoist era of who could get what kind of food. Mm. But is that well, etc. I just want to ask a follow-up question, but we'll be throwing it open for questions shortly. I've been asked to give you a good long um, um, time to ask uh, what you would like to offer us. So <coughs> please have a think about that. Um, but why? What I don't understand is that that's, are we cynics? In democracy, I mean, we, I, I don't know about you, but I listen to that. I think, yeah, of course, it's always been like this. Yeah, are the Chinese more sensitive to it? Do they have a, a higher expectation, or is it because it's been so destructive during their history that, that that's what makes them react strongly to the perception of inequity and corruption? I think when corruption begins to impact on your life, then you feel so. That's why, for example, with the sports rorts affair. It's when the clubs that really needed something and they were evaluated as having the right, or having, being qualified to get that help, and then they didn't get that help. So they're really outraged, right? If you're not part of that club scene, if you're not in that, you're not affected. So it really depends on how much it affects you. And many times, and I think with our level of corruption here in Australia, more and more of us are beginning to feel it. But you would remember the Paddington Bear affair. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yes. I mean, it wasn't yes, that. Yes, people did used to come get down. You know. That, yeah, I mean, a, it a wasn't that long who walked, ago. Who walked through declaring nothing at customs? And he had brought a Paddington Bear, and he didn't declare it, and he went down. That was in the 80s. Yes. You know, and that, it I did think happen, we, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I remember it very well. And and we've we've just gotten used to it. But when it affects you then it start, you know, that's why Aboriginal communities around mining, um, uh, you know, mines that were, were, you know, they're having their, um, their sacred sites blown up. Yeah. You know, this is all very corrupt activity. And then they're affected and they're hurt, right? But in China, what would happen is when you had spectacular levels of corruption, um, it very often affected a huge amount of people. When it affected the kind of critical mass of people, that's when you get the rebellions. So does anyone have a, conversa- uh, a question that they would like to throw in? Have, have a think about that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you was, was w- there's not much point talking really about modern Australia. You know, I mean, of course, people can ask about it, but why Australia and, and China can't get on. Um, but. Do you see that the, the, the regime that's existing there now is a strong one or a weak one? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I think Xi Jinping has more power than any leader since Mao and in some ways more than Mao because Mao was still part of a collective. Um, but there's a but. But there's, yeah. But when power relies also on repression and complete surveillance and control, then there's also a bit of fragility to it. But I don't see that fragility leading to any big problems for Xi in the immediate future. So the, I don't know. I just I don't predict. But on balance, so you think he's strong enough? He can hold it together. He's not in trouble. He's yes. It, the, it depends very much on a number of things. So if the economy can stay pumping along. And that's part of the whole BRI thing, to, to keep it pumping along. If the economy can stay pumping along, the people, welfare is at a level where they're OK with it. Mm. Um, if the propaganda machine can continue to uh, you know, become this kind of, I don't know, like a Truman, <laughs> the, what do you call it, the Truman? Um, Doctrine. No, no, no. The t- the Truman oh, the Show. Truman yes. Show. <laughs> you know, as long as you've got this kind of dome there, um, people will support and believe and not understand why all these countries are criticizing them for locking up terrorists in Xinjiang and so on. I mean, it depends on how much the people stay with Xi. It depends on whether corruption and other things make people unhappy enough to try to challenge Xi. It, there's so many issues, there's so many complex interconnected 
factors. You find it fascinating, don't you? I do. The whole, everything <laughs> to do with time. Is there a question? Yes. How, how corrupt is the current regime? Is there any ideas that you have about that? How corrupt is the current regime? Um, look, I, I haven't done any personal investigations, but we do know that, say, um, the New York Times, Bloomberg, and others have done major investigations into the holdings, uh, the, the financial holdings of various communist leaders, um, and they are now banned in China for those, those investigations. Um, I think that you know, when you're in China, um, you'll be in some place, some kind of, you'll be in some place like Inner Mongolia and somebody, and you'll come across some weird development and they'll say, oh, that's the daughter of Li Peng, you know, this former leader, or that's so-and-so's son. You know, it's just, it's ambient. There's an ambient level of corruption. How corrupt? How long is a piece of string? Um, and as I said, there have been people who've done really good work on this, and that's not me, um, but you can find that good work and look at it and judge. There was a question up the back, yeah. Uh, Lisa, could you uh, have a stab at explaining to me this most mysterious metaphor, built and road? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Julie just said, um, can you explain the metaphor, the mysterious metaphor of the Belt and Road? In fact, it's not that mysterious once you sort of get, a, um, once you realize what they're talking about. I know it sounds quite strange, but the Belt um, is a, so the road, I'll go to the road first, the road is a, an extension or a contemporary interpretation of the Silk Road which once linked um, the capital, which was at Xi, what we now call Xi'an, with um, basically Persia and India and all of Central Asia all the way uh, to, to Europe. So the Silk Road is, and there were tea roads as well from south, southwest China also out there. Um, and so the road is now linking trade, because trade ideas, um, friendship, whatever, you know, that's, they, they have that as part of it, um, now links China with parts of Africa and South America and until last week or so, Victoria and, <laughs> and you know. Uh, and then the belt is a reference to the, the journeys of Zheng He, who was a, a Ming Dynasty eunuch general um, who, say, who did... Um, I've just lost the number, but he did a number, I think seven, um, that might be wrong, um, it's in there, <laughs> um, major voyages. Um, and he also conducted trade, diplomacy, um, Chinese soft power, or Ming soft power to be completely accurate, because it wasn't China, it was the Ming. And, you know, people never called themselves Chinese in the Tang Dynasty, they called themselves a person of the Tang. You know, this is, Chinese is a new word from late Qing dynasty, which is new in Chinese context. <laughs> um, but yeah, so belt is the belt, the maritime belt. So it's, it's, it's Zheng He's voyages and the Silk Road. And it, I mean, it has been before it became known as the Belt and Road Initiative. I, I remember about, I don't know, it was called six years ago, going to Ethiopia and just seeing this country being, the, the air was thick with the dust that had been thrown up as the, as the roads were built to, to, to extend the reach of the Chinese and they went to, it's an extraordinary period in Chinese history now. Have they ever been this powerful before? Uh, in relatively speaking, I mean I don't know because there's many ways of measuring power but the Tang Dynasty was really open and really, really um, prestigious and globally, like the soft power of the Tang was amazing. Kyoto was modeled on the Tang capital. The kimono and the, the, the hanbok in Korea 
uh, were developed out of the dress of women in the Tang. Um, and so people really loved China. It was an amazing place. And there was so much you know, uh, interconnection. I mean, powerful, maybe if you think of it as part of Genghis Khan's empire, the Yuan, that was pretty powerful. It wasn't necessarily great with soft power. <laughs> Rape and pillage usually isn't. <laughs> but um, the Ming dynasty, the prestige of the products of the Ming were incredible. So Egyptians were wearing robes of, China, of Ming dynasty silk. And in one of the famous, uh, as a famous Renaissance painting, um, in which um, an adoration of the of the is it magi magi, magi. Mm. Um, in which magi. the one of the kings is holding a Ming Dynasty bowl. All that exquisite. I don't know. And yeah. at the same time, this is a country which seems to have have a genius for the worst kind of punishments. To wit, <laughs> even when they're not meant to be the punishment, foot binding. Yeah. What that is just, that? What is that about? Okay, so you've got punishments, which are like slow slicing. Oh yes, that's yeah, right. that kind of thing. That's where that's death of a thousand cuts came yeah. from. I love that. <laughs> they literally used to slice them like carpaccio, <laughs> bit by bit by bit. Yeah. I mean, this slowly over days. Mm. Um, mm. Actually, can I just like before I go to the foot binding, just really quickly, I have to say this. I have. What my one regret in life, as I confess to the Asia Book Room um, owner, she knows this because I say this to her every time I see her. This is in Canberra, a, a bookshop devoted to Asian books and things. Uh, in, in 1986 or 7, I saw a book done by Jesuits. It was a rare edition and it was illustrations of tortures in different kinds of Chinese torture. And there were exquisite illustrations, and they had that kind of like wax paper in between, and they you were stole it, didn't you? No, I wanted it, but it was cost $170 or something, and I didn't have the money. And I was like, oh, I really regret it. The last time it came through, a, a copy came through there, it was something like $7,000. <laughs> so, uh, your loss, but as loss. to oh, yeah. torture, why, as to is it, why the enormous amount of finesse? To they put into torments. Uh, that's an interesting question. But should I jump to the foot binding? Foot binding? Yes. Okay. Foot binding was not punishment. It was. Um, I mean, it was pretty punishing. Um, but it originated, and its origins are slightly mysterious. I and it's believed that this Tang, late Tang emperor was in love with a dancer, and either she had really tiny feet, or she bound her feet in white cloth to resemble crescent moons. Mm. And um, so there was there was that kind of thing. And, and a lot of things that happened in the court would ripple out. Like at one point, one concubine walked, um, this, this would be me if I was a concubine, um, <laughs> walked into a, a glass screen, like, oops, <laughs> and cut her face and got this jagged scar. But the emperor still loved her. And um, very, very much. And all the women um, began to paint with rouge, like scars on their cheeks. Um, when a gay emperor cut his sleeve off for his lover rather than disturb him um, when they were napping on the bed and the emperor had to go, uh, lots of men in the court began cutting off their sleeves. So things rippled out from the courts. And so this idea of these small feet rippled out, but it became this thing of it became associated with womanly virtue. Um, and it, the bindings were put on young girls' feet and drawn tighter and tighter until the bones were broken and the feet were drawn into a kind of a hoof. Yes. And I've actually got a disgusting picture in here. It is truly bound. disgusting. It is yes. really get, get shocking. someone to warn you. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, and that was... And the thing is, in the Song Dynasty, which was a kind of a neo-Confucian revival, but they, they went really hardcore with conservative sort of attitudes, and especially towards women and so on, in the Song. And one of these people were like, yeah, this is good. Keeps women at home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but sadly, that carried on. We've got time. Another question. Uh, Olivia, I mean, you touched on um, gender sort of trends, and obviously you've written history, but I, I know you've lived in China for extensive periods. Some of the modern trends in gender, you, you look at Japan where increasingly women aren't marrying. In China has this unique problem of the bare branches, this excess of men, which is almost a national security problem. Um, and on top of that, tell us some of the remnants of the one child policy. How do you see that affecting 
some of the gender threats? It's, it's a really interesting question, Tanvir. That's really interesting. The, the gender issues in, in China and the, the effects of the one-child policy. So one thing that's been happening lately is a number of men are um, actually marrying um, women from surrounding countries, including Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, and Vietnam, and so on. So there, there's some outward movement there. Um, the government constantly wants to get um, intelligent single women to marry peasants and less qualified men, and they won't. Um, and so there's actually a big movement among young women to be independent. Um, they really don't want to marry. The government is trying to encourage people to have more children. Um, maybe 30 years ago they would have, but now a lot of people are like, yeah, housing is really expensive, and you know we're both working. And so the, the two-child or more-child policy has been very slow to take off. Not that many people have jumped on it. So there's a demographic real demographic problem happening in China. Um, and it is women, women are becoming more, there's a really big movement. It's not all women in China by any means, but there is definitely a big feminist movement, a big movement to not marry. There's a number of people who don't want to marry. They don't want to have kids. Um, it's quite interesting. It's at a, it's at a stage where I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, but the demographic problem is really severe, which is probably why the government has loosened up the rules on, say, Chinese men going to other countries and bringing back brides. Yes, Rachel. Um, the culture of the eunuch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's my favorite <laughs> The culture of the eunuch. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, uh, so eunuchs, there began to be, um, go back about uh, over 2,000 years, maybe 2,500 years, and people would have... Well, you um, not that long to go so far. Okay, so <laughs> I'll be quick. <laughs> go back there, but, but come back fast. Yeah, I'll come back fast. In the beginning, um, people had um, castrated slaves, and, some t and castration was a punishment. So a, a man could get punished, and then they could be a slave. So at various times in history, people could castrate their slaves. They were allowed to. Um, now, the reason you would want that is that way that that castrated man could look over, look, could guard your harem, and you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, children looking like mm, the postman, <laughs> you know, um, so or looking like the guard of the harem. So they were very useful that way. Um, then it began to be a thing where, in the courts of emperors. Um, again, they had big harems. Some of them had thousands of concubines. And so they needed people to look after them. And these and castrates were often, some people would castrate their sons, very, very poor peasant families, because this was the only way they saw to get, to get their family to have, you know, riches or some chance of advancement and food. I mean, you know, um, and so people went into the palace um, as castrate. Some of them had been punished and had been castrated. Some had their parents castrated. The saddest story in the whole book is of this poor guy who was castrated basically 10 minutes to the end of the last dynasty. And he, yeah, he only died in 1997. And he kept, the castrates would keep their precious, as it was called, <laughs> in a little container. And they would carry around their precious and this is another thing with belief. So you've got Confucianism, which doesn't believe in anything like reincarnation. It's very, um, you've got, and they believe it's really important to carry on sons and carry on your families. Then you've got um, the Buddhists. Buddhism came into China in around, I don't know, a couple hundred uh, AD sort of thing. And those Buddhists, you know, talked about reincarnation. So the, the castrates, the eunuchs, were Buddhists because they believed they could be reincarnated and if they carried their precious with them, they could be reunited with their precious. Mm -hmm. oh, it, I must be... Can I just ask, how did they become, like you talked about, a number of them becoming very wealthy and corrupt? How, how, did, they, how did that come from someone that was... 
the talented ones among them, and there were many, um, got the confidence of the emperor. Um, they were able to become, and they often, for whatever reason, were made in charge of the emperor's bodyguard. Um, they would get these important positions. And what happened was several times emperors were like, the eunuchs are becoming way too powerful. We've got to stop this. So um, one emperor, the founder of the Ming Dynasty, said, emperors, uh, sorry, eunuchs will be denied any kind of education because if they're illiterate, they can't get involved in govern government. They can't become advisors. They can't become that powerful. But one of his grandchildren or great-grandchildren said, I really like this eunuch who's been looking after me since I was a kid. And he founded a school for eunuchs um, in the palace. And once eunuchs got education and they could give good advice or bad advice, um, they had also they were in charge of the stores. So in charge of the storerooms, um, the tribute that came in from other countries or from, say, the South sends the best tea. And Burma sends jade and all this stuff. So that they were in charge of these giant warehouses and things just kind of fell off the back of the truck um, quite often. Uh, they had multiple opportunities once in the palace and at a certain level to exploit their position. And maybe it's just the way it fell in the story, but they seem to do a lot of plotting. A great <laughs> deal of plotting. Big plotters. Yes. yes. They were pretty good plotters. And often they became good friends with the concubines because they were watching the concubines, right? So they were guarding the concubines. They might become really close. Cixi, so and I didn't really write this in here because it was just, it's the shortest history. But Cixi, <laughs> the Empress Dowager Cixi, had a, 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 a eunuch, Li Lianying, who she was really, really close to. And they used to take these kind of, when they, she loved photography, so she would take these fanciful vignettes where she was, um, she was the bodhisattva. And Li Lianying was offering various things. As, you know, I mean, they, they used to play together. They were friends, and he was also a co-plotter in a whole bunch of intrigues. Plots do feature very heavily. And we could actually go and talk forever because it's, it's hugely entertaining to read. <laughs> I've got to say, I, mean, I was in China a few years ago, and, and it was um, in, in, up in Jiangjing where, where the repression was just starting. And it is... I would say for an outsider, it's hard to love because there is so much repression that is so visible. Um, and, and it was a delight for me reading this book because there are so many great stories and it makes you see, um, at least begin to think, how much is prejudice, you, history, what you, what, what you think you know, and how much of it is you just didn't know. And um, there is just... A riot of, of stories here. I advise you to uh, entertain yourself, and I don't often do that. Um, I never encourage people to read certain books, never. <laughs> um, but I think Linda will be prepared to sign some uh, books. I'm down and come and explain about that. But can I ask you just to say a warm thank you to this excellent author? And thank you.